So a while ago, I had this real important early meeting with an investor. And it took me months to uh, get on in the schedule. Uh, it was an exciting time. So the night before, I went to bed early. I set not one, but two alarms, because the responsible adult that I am. Um, and the next morning, I woke up before either of those two uh, went off. So I tiptoed to the bathroom, not wanting to wake up my wife to relieve myself. Shit! So much for not waking up the wife. Going back into the uh, bedroom, apologizing first, then picking up various pieces of alarm clock all, all around the room. I go into the shower to take a nice relaxing shower to wash the sleep out of my eyes. I turn on the water and, oh, that is fucking cold. Sure, that heating unit is 20 years old and it should have been replaced a few years ago, but hey, if it works, it works unless when it doesn't. So I go up into the attic, shivering cold, but naked to reset the whole system, wait for 10 minutes, go downstairs again, step into the shower, and finally defrost under the now hot, nice running water. All right, these things happen. I factored in some time. So I can still like make my train and grab a coffee at the station. It's, it's going to be all good. So I go downstairs, eat a quick breakfast, pretty proud of myself for not spilling anything on my shirt. And I hop on my bike to uh, a bike to the train station. Traffic is low at this time of day. It's early morning. So uh, hey, plenty of time. We're all good. A flat tire. All right, so there's no buses along my bike route, so I just guess I will just walk. So at a pace a bit faster than comfortable at my fancy dress shoes, I walk to the station, all sweaty, just in time to see my train leave. But hey, I'm, I'm a positive thinker, right? So upside, I have like 20 minutes to spare now, so I can buy that coffee, buy some deodorant, because I don't want to be like the smelly dude. Um, and 20 minutes later, I actually like, catch my train. No more issues there. So once I get to where I need to go, I make sure to be the one out of the train first, run up the stairs, grab the first cab, and say, yo, uh, to the district, uh, business district. Um, so I get out, and traffic was, was okay, so I even made up five minutes of those 20 minutes I was late. And I texted the investor's assistant along the way, so we're all good. So I report to the front desk, I'm ushered into the meeting room, and then the investor walks in. Like a seven foot tall, fit male, uh, with a three piece suit and like this double Windsor knot in his tie. And we shake hands, or better, he gives me this stare, and then he, he applies this death grip handshake for just a bit too long. And before I can even apologize, he says, if this is how you fell in my time, we should probably end this meeting right now. Wait, what? I coped with the alarm clocks, the ice cold shower. I walked to the station. I even made up five minutes of lost time while smelling nice. So, so what did they expect? That I would just set up a tent the night before their front lawn? I mean, I did my best. And sure, I hate it when I need to explain how things are not my fault, but sometimes life just gets in the way. Why can't the dude just be a bit more nice about it? Maybe it should be a bit more empathetic. All right, so let's do an experiment. Um, you, sir, I'm just going to throw you the pen and then uh, you try and catch it. All right, so what just happened? Got it. You got it. So let's do this step by step, right? So 
uh, I'm Roy, so Roy through, through to, right? Yeah, you're doing awesome. And then you, A plus, okay. Now throw back. Bam, so what happened? Yes. You're the best. Right. Yeah, let's do it again. See, so that's it. <laughs> All right, so what just happened? Uh, I threw the pen to Roy, and Roy wasn't paying attention to you. <laughs> so that's not what happened. What actually happened is the pen was thrown. It flew through the air, and then I saw it fall on the ground. That's what happened, and I, I chose this example on purpose because everyone just says uh, he didn't catch it, or so uh, it's not you, it's the human race um, who have this human reaction to focus on the negative or what's not there. We compare what has happened to prior experiences we've had. So why am I telling you this? Because I want us to be nicer and more understanding of others. And that's not always easy. When walking over here this morning with giving a talk on empathy on my mind, the driver who almost ran me over, well, I didn't think, well, there must be a valid reason for this person's actions. I thought, what an asshole. I too often assume the worst in people. And it's time to change that. So as you guessed by the title of the talk, it's not just about empathy. It's also about providing a framework to enable you to be more empathetic by using acting. So what if instead of playing a scripted character, we use acting techniques to play a different person, a real human in our lives? This is a framework based on the notion that all acting essentially boils down to faking a situation. While bad acting also fakes emotion, great acting uses real emotion, genuine emotion, to apply that to a fake situation. This framework is about recognizing the emotional state someone is in and then use your emotional memory, things you've lived through and then relive them and apply them to what they're going through. This important thing, and I'll be reiterating this in various ways uh, throughout the presentation, that good acting is a make-believe situation plus a recalled emotion. This does not make sense yet, but uh, in the end, this will all fall into place. Uh, I'm Roy. You can tweet me if you want. I have been taking acting classes for the last nine years, both on scripted and improvisational theater. And during the day, I'm a co-founder of AdAppSignal, the best APM for Ruby and Elixir. And I'm a human, and I also tend to interact with other humans. And I've learned that that is way easier when you get to practice empathy once in a while. By the end of this session, you will understand why you should be empathetic, and you want to practice empathy all day, every day. And in addition, you will be better method actors than Marlon Brando and Daniel Day-Lewis combined. I definitely will not succeed, but I'm going to give my best shot anyway. So let's first establish some ground rules to what empathy actually is in this context. According to dictionary.com, empathy is the psychological identification with or vicarious experiencing of the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. Or to keep it simple, Empathy is the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And I mean this in the broadest possible sense. To be empathetic, you need to let go of any baggage you're carrying around. Um, your values, the way you were raised, uh, your abilities, anything you consider to be normal. Because we want to create this blank canvas which we can build upon to create our character. So we can finally see through their eyes, and more importantly, feel what they're feeling. 
Before diving in deeper, a quick thought on sympathy. Sympathy versus empathy. Like sympathy is to empathy what thoughts and prayers are to taking action. Talk is cheap. Being sympathetic is cheapish, while being empathetic takes serious effort. And even though those two terms, sympathy and empathy, are often used interchangeably, they are two totally different things. And I get why people, why people confuse them, because both of them deal with the relationship we have to feelings and experiences of others. Sympathy means you feel sorry for a situation someone is in. That doesn't actually improve the situation someone is in, and it doesn't give them the confidence that you actually understand them. Now, don't get me wrong, being sympathetic is okay. It's probably better to feel sorry for a situation someone is in than not acknowledging the situation at all. But you shouldn't stop at being sympathetic. Showing pity focuses on weakness, while through empathy, your goal should be to lift someone up. Practicing empathy is also about self-care. Of course, empathy should be about anyone but ourselves, but we like it if there's something in it for us too, right? And you're in luck, because practicing empathy is also beneficial to the practitioner. So let's say your colleague does something stupid. Um, it's real easy to get irritated and worked up. You just fuck that, that idiot, and then maybe complain to others about him or her, or they being an idiot. Because again, it's easy to focus on the negative. If you focus on negative emotion instead of improving the situation. And empathy turns that around and enables you to not drag others with you as well. So before getting into an office setting, let's look at a classical movie, TV example, good cop, bad cop. The purse grabbing perp sits in this uh, uh, interrogation room and then one dude hovers over him shouting like, you're going down. Uh, and they start crying. Uh, he's obviously the bad cop. Then in the back of the room, there's the, uh, the good cop. He stands there and watches, walks over there, pushes the bad cop away, and then in a soft spoken voice says, well, if you just help us out and give up your crew, then uh, we can make a deal, probably, and uh, tell the DA you cooperated. This is a classical example of the drama triangle. The drama triangle is a social model for destructive human interaction that can and often will occur in conflict. And it's all too common in office culture as well. Uh, the theater on the social model was published in 1968 uh, by Cartman. Uh, uh, no, Carp Mun. Uh, he was a doctor of medicine, or he is a doctor of medicine, and back in 68, he also was interested in, interested in acting and a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So he wrote about the drama triangle and the three faces of drama. First, as a victim. A victim feels or acts like a victim, whether others consider them a true victim or not. They feel helpless and powerless, and it could be by circumstance, but also by choice. Some victims want or need to feel victimized. At the office, Bob is the victim. Bob does the dishes every single day. Alice, Alice drinks coffee too, she never does the dishes. Bob always cleans his cups and Alice's cups. The victim is enabled by the rescuer. The rescuer feels guilty when not helping the victim. But on the other hand, they also want to keep the victim helpless. It's often a mechanism to not having to cope with one's own issues. Now Carol, Carol is the rescuer. Carol brings her own cup of coffee from home. Um, so Carol does not make any dishes dirty. But still, she offers Bob help. She says to so Bob, you know what, Bob? I'll help you out, and twice a week, I'll do the dishes, because Alice is a mean. 
Then there's the persecutor. The persecutor blames the victim. Uh, they're angry at them because it's all their own fault. Alice hates Bob and his whining. Seriously, Bob comes in early every single day just so he can get the dishes done before she comes in, which enables him to complain to Carol. Bob is an asshole. These kind of drama triangles appear at the office like, way more often than you would probably think um, when you start looking at it from tomorrow on. In the workplace, make sure you don't become the bad cop. Don't become the persecutor. Because she will reinforce the victim, involve a rescuer, and then shit hits the fan, basically. So what I do when I see uh, a conflict arise, I just step back, reflect on my role. Am I the rescuer, the persecutor, the victim? And maybe I just step out. Because a triangle needs three corners. As soon as you take one corner out of the equation, the whole thing collapses. All right, empathy, drama triangle, so acting, right? Well, acting offers a bunch of useful traits you can use like every day, whether you want to practice empathy or not. And a lot of those I'm about to show apply to improvisational theater, and some of them also apply to scripted work. So what does acting teach? Acting teaches to truly listen. All of our actions are based on the actions and emotions of others. When acting, you need to truly listen to whoever you're playing with. You can't get away with like checking Twitter and then nodding and, and mumbling. That will never advance a scene. A reaction is required and expected to keep going in theater. So acting teaches to listen. Acting also teaches to be accepting. Often, especially in improvisational theater, everything is made up on the spot. So if I say, there's a door here, and the other one isn't paying attention, it's really easy to just like walk through the door. Yes, if it's open, that's OK. Um, but the door is here. If you don't acknowledge that, you're in denial. And being in denial in this context means you're rejecting the information or ideas or emotions of others. And if you're in denial in theater, audience won't believe you. So everything is accepted as the absolute truth. You can't ignore input and still come across as a genuine character. Acting also teaches to let go of status, to not be afraid to speak up. In real life, your status is pretty much fixed. Um, your boss is going to be higher in status than you are. The bastard who almost ran you off the road is going to be lower in status, at least to you. And these differences in status don't constantly inf influence the way you interact with others. And if it does, they're probably in, in, in an unhealthy relationship. When there is a conflict, though, difference in status becomes a key ingredient. In acting, status is actively determined, your status in relationship to others. You work together to determine who has a high status and who has a low status. And by switching roles, you're enabled to speak up instead of keeping quiet. Because of that, acting also teaches to work together. Actors feed off each other. Through play, they learn who has a high and the low status. And the beauty is that, contrary to real life, none of them need or want to win. It's about the process and not about the end result. When acting, statuses may shift at any time if it's beneficial to the scene, and it just happens spontaneously, which often doesn't happen in real life. Acting also teaches to work what is there. What isn't on stage doesn't exist, and what hasn't been said doesn't exist either. Acting requires to let go of everything to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So blah, blah, acting. What is acting? That's a great question, and I do not have the answer. You can ask 10 actors what acting is. You'll get 10 different results, or 10, 10 different answers, and they're all equally valid. 
To me, acting is feeling a genuine emotion in a make-believe situation. But what all actors do agree on is that acting is always about conflict. And in theater, conflict has a broad meaning. Sure, a fist fight is a conflict. But going through rehab is also a conflict. Or not being able to decide on a name for your baby, that's also a conflict. In real life, we're not looking for conflict. Or I hope at least we're not constantly looking for conflict. But if conflict does arise, and you don't stop it in its tracks, it will snowball into something big and unstoppable. And practicing empathy helps to resolve conflict, and I'll show you how in a bit. Acting is a craft, and there are many approaches to how to train actors, and there are many variations on those approaches. I'm not even going to try to touch on any of them apart from the method. Well, the method, you probably know because of a handful of famous method actors. One of them, Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, you may know him from movies like Gang of New York, or There Will Be Blood, Phantom Threat, The Last of the Mohicans, and a bunch more, but not that many. Day-Lewis describes acting as the gravitational pull of another life that fires one's curiosity. Day-Lewis almost literally becomes his character. And if you compare his roles, there are little similarities. Um, Day Lewis learned Czech just so he could speak Czech, or no, he could speak English with a Czech accent. He spent months in a wheelchair when playing a disabled person, had to be lifted on set across lighting cables because he wouldn't come out of his wheelchair. Before playing a Native American, he learned how to track and skin animals. When he played a wrongly convicted inmate, he spent 48 hours in jail without food, without drink, followed by a non-stop nine-hour police interrogation. Heck, he even texts his co-stars in character as Abraham Lincoln. He becomes the character. When he's on set, he's Lincoln in a period setting. When he steps off set, he's like a 21st century Lincoln. He has his iPhone, starts texting co-stars and signs Love Abe. He is that person. Some good news, this is not the kind of method acting you need to uh, employ. <laughs> it would help, but they may, may not find like a rabbit to skin in time and things like that. Um, and I want to do just, just to Day Lewis. He is probably one of the best actors out there. But he's also the most common illustration about what method acting is about, while there are also less visible layers to it. So a real short history. Konstantin Stanislavski came up with what he called the system back in 1930s Russia. Then he took it to the US, and there he met with uh, Strasbourg, uh, Adler, and, and Meissner. So Lee Strasbourg focused on the psychological aspects, Stella Adler on the sociological, and Sanford Meissner on the behavioral. Uh, today I'll be talking about the Strasbourg approach, which revolves around what he called effective memory but it's also known as memory recall. It's the ability, to, the ability to summon emotions from your own life and apply those to your role. So how does method acting help with practicing empathy? Well, as I said, practicing empathy is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. See where we're getting? Method acting enables you to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So in theater, there's going to be a character in a script. For us, there's going to be any real life human being. We're going to approach situations as if they are played by an actor. And we already do this subconsciously. We switch roles during the day all of the time. By using acting techniques, we're enabled to actively choose how to react. Instead of subconsciously switching roles, we'll be consciously switching roles. So this is our own method, I think, I came up with. So let's call it the empathetic acting method, because there is no I in team. You can use team with people you know at least something about. You can't use this with a random stranger in the street. You need to know enough about something, but usually you know enough about your coworkers. Uh, you know where they live, 
sort of their background, uh, their relationship status, whether they have children, things like that. We're going to use that information to kind of like guess initially their emotional state of mind. We'll then use that to determine where conflict comes from and how it makes people feel. And our goal is not to solve a problem, or at least not a primary goal. The goal is to identify and learn how someone reacts and use that as input to potential problem solving. So there are five steps to team. The first one is to let go, to determine the basic emotion, to listen and learn, to determine the complex emotion, and to apply memory recall. So first, let go of everything. And this is by far the hardest step, especially if you're part of the conflict yourself. Um, I'm late to a meeting, and it sucks for me that I had a cold shower and a flat tire, but I'm posing and imposing a problem on you too, because your schedule is off for the rest of the day. Too bad you need to shake that off. When you have those intertwined conflicts floating around in the back of your mind, you cannot be truly empathetic. You cannot try to feel what I'm feeling by also thinking, what an asshole for screwing up my schedule. And of course, your emotions are equally important, right? So later on, we'll go hard on the issue, but for now, we're going soft on the person. Let go of everything, your status as well. Like we're all humans, and we're all equals on a personal level. There may be a bunch of other valid conflicts going around, even unrelated. There may be a stone in your shoe that's bothering you, which in this context, a context is a conflict, but unless you know the other person also has a stone in its shoe, uh, you should ignore it for now. Second, you need to determine the basic emotion. We want to do, use this to kind of like build our character on. And you're all like grown-ups, you've all experienced a wide range of emotions, so you are all able to use memory recall to summon them from uh, the depths of your brain. In this step, we're simplifying the whole thing by sticking to the four basic emotions, uh, which is anger, fear, sadness, and happiness. So we're laying the foundation by kind of like guessing the emotional state someone is in uh, and choose one of those four emotions for them. So I, I walk into the office breathing like this, <laughs> I'm probably could be sad or I could be in fear. I'm probably not angry or happy. I want to come in smiling, I'm probably happy, and when I come in cursing, uh, I could very well be angry, right? So now let's determine the basic emotion. Next, we want to dig deeper. We're going to learn more about the conflict by applying active listening techniques. Again, I come in with my high chest breathing, and you pay attention. Just by looking at me, that may give me the confidence to open up to you and tell me about the conflict I'm experiencing. If not, you could just walk up to me and give me your undivided attention. That means not checking your phone, uh, not saying hi to a passing colleague. Just look at me. And that may get me to open up to you. And if not, encourage me. Just ask, hey, what's up? Keep an open posture. Um, you can use a bunch of gestures. When I open up and I'm talking to you, you can nod. You can mirror my facial expression. You can slant your head slightly. You can give formal reinforcement. Mm -hmm. But these could also be tricks you can abuse. You can pretend to be actively listening by Slanting your head, nodding, saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with some practice that may come across as a giant reaction, while you're actually being an asshole. So let's just don't do that, right? Give me feedback so I know that you actually understand me. And if you don't feel you understand me, then ask questions. Don't make any assumptions. Don't make any judgments. 
don't offer a solution. We just want to find out which conflict caused my emotion. So based on my breathing is fear or sadness, right? So you ask me what's going on, and I tell you that I heard like down the hall that a company is about to down downsize. I may be losing my job. Now, my wife lost her job a month ago. It's already down to a single income. If I lose my job, I won't be able to make my mortgage payments. I'll be kicked with my house. You already know I have two small children, so that's a big thing for me. So you say you understand. You summarize the issue. You ask how I found out. Don't apply anything, so you may want to ask, well, who did you overhear? You may not want to say, did you overhear Jack? Because he, he's always bullshitting, right? So keep it like an open thing. Don't lead, don't imply. So now you know my basic emotion. You know some more details about my conflict. You can now determine the complex emotion. You now know my high chest breathing came from fear. Uh, I know why. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not because I'm afraid of losing my job. It's because I'm afraid of not being able to provide for my family. Now, each basic emotion contains a wide range of complex emotion. If I'm in fear, I could be alarmed, frightened, in shock, a panic, mortified, anxious, nervous, etc. Those are all fear at different amplifications and in different appearances. I fear not being able to provide, which I would say makes me anxious. Anxiety, according to the dictionary, is a, could, be, could be caused by a situation that seems uncontrollable and unavoidable, and the mood state of not being ready to cope with upcoming negative events. Well, that kind of fits like a glove. Now, with that in mind, you're ready to become truly empathetic. Because in step five, we'll be applying the memory recall technique. Again, being empathetic means you're vicarious, uh, vicariously experiencing the feelings of another. So you take this blank canvas. You've let go of everything. And now you turn into me, a middle-aged white man with two small children, an unemployed spouse, who's about to lose his job, or at least afraid he is, and that will get him kicked out of his family home. You have likely never experienced this. And even if you did, you will have felt different, emotion, different emotions than I'm feeling right now. So think of a time where you, when you were anxious. Maybe you traveled to the US for RailsConf and were afraid you wouldn't be admitted into the country because of some travel ban. Uh, maybe you got here this morning anxious about not being able to make a connection and spending three days all on your own. Maybe you're anxious because you had to do like this presentation and your laptop wouldn't boot. Now, the amount of anxiety you felt is going to be different from me. So uh, to me, it always feels like the end of the world. Like losing my job, I'm like at 80% an anxious. So now think of what you went through what triggered your anxiety, and then try to amplify that emotion up to 80%. Now you're feeling a real, still real, but amplified emotion. Now, and this takes time and training, don't think about your trigger anymore. Don't think about what caused this emotion for you. Instead, remaining in that mood state, think about my problem, my conflict. So now you're efficient being me, going home, telling my wife, well, honey, we have to sell the place. And when you, while you do that, you're still feeling that 80% anxiety that was triggered by something totally different, but you now apply to this specific situation. This should prevent you from ever thinking that someone is overreacting. You can't blame someone for their true feelings. By doing this, you'll be able to really step in my shoes and really feel what I'm feeling. And then congratulations. You just discovered empathy through acting. As a bonus, optional sixth step, conflict resolution. So empathy reached. You can stop here. Go home. That was it. But sometimes you just want to resolve an issue, right? So in this case, you may 
tell me, like, maybe we should first figure out if they're actually downsizing. And if so, whether your job is at stake. If you're part of the conflict, you should go hard on the issue. Empathy should never be used to sugarcoat anything. I can be empathetic towards you and say, well, yeah, I feel how it sucks to lose your job, but hey, you punch your boss in the face at a Christmas party. I can be empathetic towards you and your feelings, but still, like say, it's your own fault. So in the end, I guess I just want to say that I want you to be nice. I think practicing empathy leads to new insights in how to prevent and resolve conflict. And though conflict resolution is great, the goal of the exercise is to let people know that they're understood at a personal level. People can only flourish in a herd of humans when they know they are being understood while being themselves. And that is what being empathetic enables. I can share with my colleagues uh, what ticks, what makes me tick. And I don't want or need any preferential treatment. But knowing of all of us what's going on in our lives, now we feel about that, is all in our shared interest. It's a shared interest to be open to our feelings as a base for conflict prevention and resolution and keep going where we all need to, need to go, and which enables growth. I believe that by practicing empathy, we can make life better for the people around us and for ourselves. And when enough people practice empathy, that should make society as a whole feel more inclusive. So maybe you're not the, da the new Daniel Day-Lewis. Maybe you do not want to practice empathy all of the time. But maybe, just maybe, the next time when that colleague is late again to a meeting, eyes half, half shut, seemingly zoning out, don't yell at him, why are you late again? Maybe just ask, how's your newborn doing? Thank you very much.